Good evening, colleagues. Uh, my name is Sidi Rakolote, the founder and the trustee of Progressive Social Economic Investment Institute. It is a public benefit trust that has been established to conduct various public uh, benefit activities, which also includes hosting webinars. Today, we are focusing on power, privilege, and oppression, the South African story. And our presenter is one of the founders of the Progressive Social Economic Investment Institute, uh, Mr. Komani, who is a PhD candidate at Vets University. Without a waste of time, I'll hand over to Mr. Goman. Over to you, Mr. Goman. Over to you, Mr. Goman. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, colleagues. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time, precious time, to come and attend this uh, session. As it was indicated, uh, our topic today has to do with power, privilege, and oppression. And we want to reflect on the South African context, although we can cite some examples from other countries, including USA, with regard to oppression. Many at times when people talk about oppression, they think of racism only, whereas it is not the case. And it is understandable precisely because if you reflect on South African context, you will see that uh, apartheid regime came up with a racism in order to demarcate borders between black and white people in order to ensure that blacks are disadvantaged while simultaneously uh, privileging whites. So the topic, as you can see, power, privilege, and oppression, they are inextricably linked to each other. So this is the presentation framework and I want people to engage with this topic because it is never clear cut. So we need to make sure that we engage in every issue so that every issue about oppression crystallizes in our minds so that we are very articulate in terms of how we analyze the situation in South Africa and elsewhere with respect to existence of oppression of any type. The first uh, point with regard to the presentation framework, I will establish the link between power, privilege, and oppression. So the second one, I will look at the dimensions and domains of oppression. That is to say, levels at which it manifests itself, and then a situation within which it also manifests itself. And that is the interpersonal, individual, or psychological, and we also focus on structural, which consists of institutional and societal levels. So this, in a way, give us a context with regard to the levels and the domains within which oppression takes place. And we also look at the global, the regional, the local and economic uh, domains, because that is where it manifests itself. And the third item would be the reflection, where I would like colleagues to engage, to debate on this particular issue of oppression. So, and then the first thing, which is very much important, is to ensure that we define what is power. And then how often do I hear people saying, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. But we need to make sure that we are sharp and sure in terms of what is power, so that we are not stretching the concept meaninglessly. So the point is that the definition of any concept should fundamentally track what is wrong, what is fundamentally wrong in the society and serve a normative purpose for achieving issues of equality, issues of social justice and transformation. For example, I always cite an example about the definition of the concept of minority in South Africa. If I were to ask you, what is minority in South Africa? The question is not, the answer is likely to, to differ. But our definition of minority if you were to ask me what is minority between white and black people, I am likely to say that it is black people, they are minority precisely because they are the marginalized, they are the subordinated, they are the exploited, and most importantly, they are the most oppressed or downtrodden, downtrodden members of the society. So the minority in this particular concept, in this particular context, helps me to track down what is fundamentally wrong. I like to stretch it to a meaningless 
But others would say minority is about black people are minority because every time when we go to vote, we know that we win the elections because we are minority. And that does not, it means meaning it's not something which is static. It is contextual, it is historical. So it depends on time and place because majority, minor, majority definition, minority, the way in which it is defined is not the way in which it is defined under democratic, under certain democratic settings. And then the issue of power, coming to power, is linked to the politics. And then many people think that politics with big P, big P means those who are serving in government or a, a controlling state machinery to roll out service deliveries. That is a traditional definition. And that particular definition is narrow in the sense that it does not take into account the fact that power is everywhere. Power is, access, is always in circulation. So power has to do with the capacity to influence decision making, the capacity to ensure that, to influence resource allocation and also affirm identities. And in this context, power is a, is a social contract construct that influences relation in every domain of our lives and the ability to influence the course of events. And then power has got many faces. I think there are three faces. The first one is power over. If you have got power over, it means that is very oppressive because you have got power over other people qua their membership to a particular social identity. And there is also, also power to, 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 power to denote agency. That is the ability to determine or influence the direction that which one takes. And there is a power with which is very much important in the context of South Africa and transformation, because it talks to issues of solidarity in order to achieve social transformation. And then there are also domains of power. One is structural. We will see that within the society, there are certain institutions which have got structures of power that are responsible for distributing power. And that is why we say power is structural. And then disciplinary power has to do with the art of managing people. That is through persuasion or coercion to ensure compliance. And then we also have hegemonic power. Hegemonic power is about distributing what is regarded as normal, accepted or conventionally accepted in the society in terms of ideology, in terms of culture. It is often known as common sense because what fits the script is gathered as normal. And anything that does not fit the script is, 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 is regarded as a, a deviant and thereby pathologized. And then in terms of privilege, I think it is very much important, like I indicated that these concepts are linked to each other in an extricable manner. The idea of oppression, if you want to see its utility is when you contextualize it within the notion of domination and subordination or advantage and disadvantage. So if you're talking privilege, you need to contextualize that within that, con the, the, that the, 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 those particular concepts. And in this context, oppression is not simply about denying people their rights and their basic human rights. That is a means to an end. And end is to ensure that you maintain the living standard of the privileged status. For example, in South Africa, oppression was not only about denying black people their rights, their rights, the freedom of assembly, political association, and so on. It was more importantly as an end to maintain the status quo. In this particular instance, it would be white supremacy, white privilege, racial privilege. That is the status of white people. And then, Privilege, one Pekinek and George define it in a very nice way. He says it's the invisible package of an end assets, which can be compared to invisible weightless neckpack of special provision, maps, passports, codes, books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. And it rests on four claims. The first claim is that privilege has to do with systematically conferring an end advantages on ben or benefits to members of the domain groups. For example, white people 
through legislation in the past were, were privileged to get more senior jobs during apartheid. And this is the case in the current South Africa. That is why we are talking about transformation. If you look at the mining and mineral sector where I'm working, if you look at the top management, the management is occupied by white people. The higher you go, the whiter it becomes. At the bottom of the pyramid is black people, precisely because black people, they, are, uh, they constitute the majority in terms of the population that is reflected in that sector. But the more you go into the mining sector, and they, this case is applicable across various sectors, particularly within the private sector. And then these benefits that are granted are never justifiable. So in the past, you know that simply the fact that you're a white person, you are able to get a job and a more paying job by virtue of your skin. And that is just unjustifiable because skin color does not have to be a determinant of access to certain resources or material advantages. And then most of the benefits are unrecognized and invisible. So it is very difficult to detect them. Like for example, if you walk into the shop at Hillbro shop, right? You will see that every time when you get out and when you have paid, you are expected to produce what is called a sleep for the goods that you have, you have bought. But if you go to something where white are predominant in terms of residence, that does not apply. And how else can we explain that particular phenomenon? It is racism. It is racism which started during apartheid and is still finding its expression into the current context. And the privilege gives them unconditional wild cards. This is a joke, a, a joker. We call it a joke. Because if you're a white person, you move anyway, it opens the color of the skin, opens access to so many doors. Unlike if you are a black person, regardless of your position, the mere fact that you are black, you are going to be judged as a black person. But the white person, however uneducated he is, as long as he's a white person, you will see that they are likely to give that particular person a treatment, which is more important than yours. So that in a way gives them the trap, a wild card, which extends beyond their situation to cover the broader scope where they're living, putting them at ease. And that, that is privilege. And then in terms of oppression, I think we need to debunk the myth, the usage, the traditional usage is narrow of uh, uh, oppression. If you talk about oppression, what comes into my minds of many is to talk about apartheid, for example, or the, it was an oppression and it, it was cruel. You know, it was, it, it was obvious because the apartheid regime came up with legislation to narrativize white supremacy and racial privilege, right? To justify the social order in which black people were regarded as inferior and white people were superior. And that was uh, engineered through various systems, including the education system, which was denied, uh, uh, which was rejected in 1976, as you might be aware of that. So apartheid in its oppression in its traditional usage, you can say apartheid is one example of that, but we adopt a leftist usage because apartheid is gone formally. We need to put caveat to say that it does not necessarily mean that its remnants and vestiges are not there, they are still there. The notion of a, a uh, uh, the, the notion of apartheid present put this matter into context. What we are saying here is that oppression or apartheid is not something that has passed. It is something that is existing. As you know, that systems are so intelligent in such a way that they shape shift in order to adjust and adapt themselves to the new situation. So hence you hear about the National Democratic Revolution that the NC always talk about. That is the discourse that puts transformation at the core of the state institution to say, let us transform the state institution in such a way that they take into account, they dismantle uh, all these notions of white supremacy or racial privilege or the social order that privileges white people and disadvantages black people. It is a struggle that is ongoing. So when we are talking about left, leftist usage of 
oppression, we are referring to an oppression that takes place today. It is, on a, on, is, it is taking place on a daily basis. Hence, we want to expose its everydayness. It, because it has been done as business as usual, it is being taken for granted. So we need to expose it in society, in a liberal society like South Africa, to say it is still exists, there are still remnants. Whites are still superior, blacks are still inferior. And we need to make sure that we come up with interventions that are necessary to dismantle white privilege. So when we are talking about white privilege, white supremacy, it is, a, it, 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 it is an albatross about our neck, especially our leaders who are controlling the state power with the capacity to implement policies, legislative prescripts that prescribe discrimination on the basis of race, gender, religion, age, sexual uh, orientation, and so forth. And then in terms of uh, levels of manifest manifestation, this is very much important. We need to identify avenues for change. And then in this particular instances, oppression, the targets are members of a particular group in virtue of their social identity. Apartheid, because it was a classic example of racism, and so is slavery, chattel slavery in the USA. These are classic examples of racism, but context differ because one is in the USA, the other one is in South Africa, but the, the commonalities are the same. White supremacy, black inferiority. That is what they wanted to do. They wanted to oppress black people. And the word oppression comes from the, the Latin word, which means oppressors, meaning the one who, was, who is oppressed, attacked, suffocated, pressed out, both in literal and metaphorical terms, figuratively. This is the process of treating certain members of a particular group unequally. They are in groups and they are out groups. The privileged and disadvantages. You are excluding the, the disadvantage from the economic, cultural, religious advantages. They don't enjoy them. They don't have access to that. And you are advantaging the, the dominant uh, group. In this particular case, the white people. Oppression takes place when individuals are subjected to political, economic, and social degradation in a systematic way, qua their membership of a social group. White, black people, women, physically disabled, queer people with queer identities, sex, different homosexuals, for example. All these people are subjected to some form of domination and subordination. And this is very much important. And there are also corresponding ideologies of superiority and inferiority. If you are heterosexual, you enjoy inferiority superiority. And if you are homosexual, we know very well that in South Africa, you do that. So it's during apartheid. And if you are a white person, you are superior. And a black person, you are inferior. So that was this, the, the order, the social order of the time. And that order of the time, I emphasize that it takes place even now. That is why when we come up with interventions, we want to dismantle the past and the contemporary privilege and oppression that characterized our society. And oppression has got many examples. There is racism, sexism or gender oppression, heterosexism, classicism, leukism, ableism, all these things are called isms because these are the systems that privileges certain members qua their particular social identity. Racism, white people are privileged, black people simultaneously disadvantaged, qua skin color, sexism or gender oppression, I think sex or gender is the variable or a, a, a social marker of exclusion in this context. Heterosexism is the, the, the issue of straight people, heterosexual and homosexuals. One, classicism is when you are a system that privileges people of a particular social status over the, the ones who are at the bottom rank of the, of the, 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 the strata. So Karl Marx talks about is a, a Marxism is about, uh, is a critique, is an ideological critique of uh, uh, capitalism because capitalism advances classicism is one of the characteristic of that. Hence, Marx talks about the history of the struggle in the society has been hitherto that one of the class struggle. 
a property and the property less. They have them, they have not. It's the bourgeoisie and the proletariats. Marx has written extensively about that one as well. And the, these isms are forms of oppression, are types of uh, oppressions, but they share commonalities, right? And then they're analytically distinct, but they are interrelated. But for, in terms of commonality, all of them have to do with distribution of power and privilege on one hand and disadvantage on the other. Therefore, it is very much important to use intersectionality as a tool of analysis to analyze the situation of black people in South Africa, women in South Africa, black women in particular. I will cite an example. Intersectionality is a theory that says people have multiple identities. One is a woman, she is black, she's young, she's Muslim, she's queer. All of these are identities. So when that person gets oppressed, it's not getting oppressed on the basis of one thing only, which is race. There are others, including sex, that comes into picture. And when these particular forms of isms, oppressions, converge on one person, the experience is compound. It's not additive, it is compound such that the experience that is suffered by women, for example, black women and men, black men are different because men were only advantaged in the, during apartheid by virtue of our skin. But women, they were black women, they were not advantaged. They were disadvantaged by virtue of being black and also as women. So this is something that I uh, am writing my PhD on. I'm explore, exploring the lived experiences of women in South Africa. What I found is that there is a tendency to, to, to view their experience as if it's common, as if they are getting oppressed by virtue of one uh, marker of exclusion, that is race. The issue of gender comes into the picture. The issue of ability as well. The issue of sexual orientation comes into the picture. The issue of religion comes into the picture. And so is the issue of sexual orientation or marital status, it comes into the picture and it converges in one person. So that person is at a crossroads, at the intersection. When somebody is at the intersection and different cars are coming, converging on that particular person, you can imagine what happens to that particular person. So that is what we are saying about, about black women. And then oppression takes place at various levels. So policy, like for example, in South Africa, the, the general, there is what is called transformation fallacy. There is a tendency of thinking that if we bring more women into management position, as well as in parliament, therefore you have, you have transformed. I am arguing that that is necessary, but insufficient because the environment in which they are operating is still patriarchal. The social structures of power, are still patriarchal. In other ways, they are advantaging men while simultaneously sub, uh, 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 disadvantaging them. So any, uh, any intervention that, that address one level is scratching at the surface because oppression is about abusing difference. The fact that I'm different from you in terms of skin color, then you're not like me, although there is only one race to which we all belong and that is human race but we know very well difference matters in oppression. And difference is not problematic per se. It is when the ideologies of difference are used in order to distribute resources, symbolic and material, and equally to members of the society. That is what, it is the difference that makes difference, that matters. And then oppression takes place at interpersonal level. So that means on face to face or virtually between people or um, individuals of different groups, social identities, between white and black people, interpersonal levels. That is where it happens. And that is where we are talking about the victim, black people being subjected to bias. Bias is about stereotypes, prejudice and discrimination. Stereotypes, we know very well that has to do with how you regard other people, how you think about other people, Prejudice is when there is a hatred of others, is an affective thing, is an issue of emotion. Discrimination is practicalizing it. When we are discriminating against people based on certain, uh, uh, on, on race, for example, on gender, on class, on age, marital status, 
the constitution, I think, on page 16, mentioned all these uh, social markers, or we call them subordinated identities. I think there are 16 of them. So we are not to discriminate and fairly discriminate based along those particular lines or in an analogous situation. We are not expect it is in the constitution uh, 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 declares that to be invalid. It's not constitutionally uh, uh, permissible to do that. That is interpersonal. The other one, interpersonal is about face-to-face -face between individuals, but there is this one which is more dangerous. And I always argue that with the government ever since they took power, in 1994, there was never an intervention which was amplified to address the issue of internalized oppression, which is self-directed oppression. But it is socially engineered by structural forces outside the person. So that particular person is socialized to believe that that person is inferior. So this is the process whereby members of the target group or the subordinate group take in emotionally psychologically, whether consciously or unconsciously, it doesn't matter. The belief system, the set of rationales that have been created by the dominant group to justify the subordination of the target group. It is believing the rationale that has been created, then it is the application of the rationale in both one's individual relationship. This is very, this is very much important, ladies and gentlemen, because if you think about Steve Bigo, Steve Pico said the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressed is the mind of the oppressed. In the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. He was amplifying the effects of internalizing superiority and inferiority. White people are taught to internalize superiority. Black people are, uh, 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 we call it internalized domination. Black people to the opposite and socialized to internalize inferiority. That is what is called internalized subordination. That is this man called Hudson. He wrote in the US reflecting on the US uh, situation during slavery. And until now that still holds true and that is applicable in context like South Africa. He says, when you control a person's thinking, you do not have to worry about their action. You don't have to tell them not to stand here or go on. They will find their proper place and will stay in it. You, didn't, you do not need to send them to the back door. They will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, they will cut one for their benefit. So those two quotations are amplifying the effects of internalization of inferiority and superiority. So that is why we are saying uh, 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 in individual oppression is due to socialization and the outcome is the taking of the total control of the individual victims. They are cognitive, affective, behavioral dimension. In other ways, cognitive talks about what they think. Affective is how they feel. And then behavioral is how they behave and act. So if you take control of those particular areas, that is the dimension of human being. If you want to make sure that you, that is what happens with soldiers. When you take them to go and train them, you are breaking down their, their personality and building the, your own personality to see, shoot the ends of the state. So, so it's internalized oppression. It's con it consists of three defining elements. The process. The process means, the process means the negative ideologies, the ways in which negative ideologies are instilled, perpetuated and maintained. And the state means the characteristics, the thoughts and behavior displayed by the members of the oppressed groups. And action refers to the pattern. That is very consistent. Pattern behavior that perpetuate oppression. So it is the process, is a state, is an action. That is internalized oppression. However, both interpersonal uh, oppression and individual oppression are not sufficient to explain oppression because we need a holistic picture. We need to use our tools of analysis to understand it or to, uh, 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 holistically so that we come up with uh, interventions that are integrated, that are holistic in order to dismantle the entire oppression machinery. So we need to focus on an institutional framework because oppression takes place 
at institution levels as well, through strategies, through policies, practices of the social institutions that are in the society, your schools, your churches, your religion, and so on and so forth. Your church, look at the church, you analyze what the media says about certain things about white people and so on. The church, what, what does the church say about uh, homosexual, for example? They are perpetuating the narrative that these are deviant people, where it is not supposed to be the case because this is, the, the, the constitution protect them. Religion, what is the, the main religion which is being uh, uh, elevated here? It's Christianity, as if Christianity is equated with religion, but Christianity is an example of religion. It is not a religion. It's like yourself, Mr. Uh, Raguloto, you are, you are not South Africa, you are a South African. South Africa is made up of many things. You are an example of South Africa. You are not South Africa at all. So that is the institutional level. And the societal level is the cultural level in the sense that people who do not conform to the main cultural frameworks, we are talking about norms, values, traditions, ways of being are perceived as negative, marginalized and oppressed. You can, I can talk about women. I can talk about black people. Black people are still marginalized. They're still oppressed. They're still perceived negatively. As you can see, marginalization, who occupies the CEOs, the chief executive officers of these countries, biggest companies? They are likely to be white. So that means blacks are marginalized. They are pushed to the margins. They are not at the, at the center. They are at the margin. They are, in, they are, they are at the margin. They, they have got marginal status. The, and that is one of the phases of oppression in a liberal society where we think that we have achieved political freedom. We tend to forget that no, oppression is still tentacles are still around. It still has its ugly head. How do you know, how do you just cases of oppressive conditions? The first one is violence. Violence against women, for example, in South Africa. Violence against black people in the US. It is, it is a matter of asserting control of the dominant group. In South Africa, the dominant group is is white, male, heterosexual, racist beings. In the US is white people who are, who are heterosexuals as well, Christians. And the reason why we are saying violence is structural, we, we should not read everything, you know, the liberal, in the liberal principle of individualism, everything starts, and be, starts with and, be, and ends with individual. When we see somebody committing violence, we are not linking it to the broader social context. We are saying this person needs to be punished. This person needs to be jailed. Of course, those people need to be punished and jailed. But you need to understand and read the, commi the commission of that particular act within a particular order, social order, societal order, which, which creates those conditions to happen. Violence in South Africa is structural in the sense that it is linked to inequalities, gender inequalities as well, racial inequalities. That is why most people who are suffering who are bearing the brand of the violence are women, black women for that matter. So it is not a coincidence. If you are, uh, you are if you, 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 you are uh, historically, you will think that no, no, they're just victims, they're isolated incident. But we who are historical, we will talk about apartheid, how it brutalized black people, how women were, were relegated to the lowest status in the society, black women for that matter. So it is structural. So it is every day, every day when you are denying people of their rights, every right, first generation rights, second generation rights, third generation rights and so forth. All these particular rights have to be realized and fulfilled. If you are violating them, you should know that that is how you, you creating conditions for violence to, to happen. And the victims are likely to be the ones that are marginalized and subordinated. Ex exploitation. This is the story of South African life. It happens in the mines, in the farms, in the factories, unequal payments. I've already said that. Unequal payments. Black people, you know very well that through the, the Calabar Act and so on and so forth, in terms of payments, they, they, they were not equal to white people, regardless of their level of experience, education, or competency. That's exploitation in simplest terms. Powerlessness. Powerlessness. We have spoken about power, the ability to take decisions, to distribute patronage, 
to take decisions that influence the course of events, to decide what is right, what is wrong, what is to be punished, what is to be rewarded. That they don't have that. That is why we are saying they are powerless. We are powerless. And this did not start now. It started a long time ago with imperialism, with colonialism, into apartheid, which was a, an internal colonialism, of course. That is why it's still existent even today. Marginalization, not in position of influence. We are not. If you look at the economic power, if you look at all the banks, the four banks, who's in position of influence? Who owns them? We never get told. We, we think that they are not owned by people. You know, the way in which it is very, very, uh, due to its, it, it is rendered to be usual, business as normal, inevitable and natural. We do not even ask who are the owners of these institutions that give us money, that we bank our money with. Cultural imperialism, I think this is very much important. The culture, whose dominant culture is being given priority? Whose cultural symbol are being honored? Is white, European, Eurocentric. Isn't that so? That, that is the, the standard. That is cultural imperialism. The cultural imperialism. I, I, you have seen the, the, the that and the guy who was wearing the regalia. In the Vela tradition, he went into the into the mall somewhere in Boulders, in Gauteng. And then what happens to it? He was told that he's not allowed because he was regarded as deviant because he was simply exercising his culture. He was regarded as deviant and his culture was not deemed to be normal. It is not in the mainstream. He was a deviant. That is why he was not allowed to come in. Uh, basically, that is, that, that, is, that, that is my talk. I want us to engage uh, about that about oppression that it takes place at many levels. It faces with uh, uh, established how it, it takes place. And then we have said that it is not, it is fallacious to think that it is gone. It is not something per se. It is something that is still existent. It is something that black people, black people are phenomenologically, it defines their existential condition, ways of being, black people in particular, as we are speaking now. If you look in the mind where I'm working, Transformation is never there. Although we talk about the mining charter and all these kind of things, the problem with mining charter is that black people should come into the picture and be in management position, but it does not dismantle the structures, the racial structure, the, the racial privilege, the racial oppression that is there. Because we need to start with the structure. We need to start with the institution. Social, political, cultural context is very much important. If you are not dealing with it, it's, that, it's like throwing people into the deep end. You, you have seen how the, the CEO of uh, 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 Old Mutual, I think, was marginalized as a black person. These things have got racial undertones, but it happens. But we need to, uh, our, our, our struggle is to make sure that we educate each other on this particular issue so that we're able to pick them up so that those who are occupying position of power, they're able to influence decisions in the direction that we would like to, uh, to, to go, in the direction that would dismantle the white privilege, the white power. Chairperson, I think I, I will pause here. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Komani. We are looking on the day when we will stop using the title, Mr. To You. You are almost <laughs> there. And thank you so much for, for availing yourself to share with us your understanding on the power, privilege, and oppression, the South African story. You are correct that if we don't raise our consciousness on these things, sometimes it's not easy to pick them up. Sometimes it's not easy to realize that 1994 was not an end to power, privilege, and oppression for an other race. Let me rephrase it. It was not an end for power and privilege for a particular race and it was not an end of an oppression of a particular race. It is still not an end of oppression of particular sex, 
particular religion, particular class. So understanding the dynamics of the power, privilege, and oppression will assist you when you analyze life in general and say everything that is happening, you look at it and say, in whose class interest is this thing happening? In whose gender interest, in, on, in whose religious interest is this thing happening? In whose really, uh, racial interest is this thing happening? Because everything under the sun has got an element of one exercising his power or her power or her privilege or his privilege to oppress the next one. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Goman. I will now open the floor for participants to ask questions or make comments, engaging on your presentation. Over to you, participants. You can raise up your hand and uh, make comments and uh, or raise questions. Um, I will open to all the participants. Feel free to ask questions, make comments, uh, engage. Uh, uh, as soon, Doctor, to be Mr. Komar. Okay, this this Samuel Makola here, uh, Mr. Komar. Thank you very much for the presentation. I just wanna, you know, go to the issue that you quoted. I mean, you 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 made mention of what Steve Pico said that the weapon for the oppressor is the oppressed's mind. Now, if we look at the issue of apartheid, I mean, the system was well thought through and they used every mechanism that they could use to make sure that, you know, the, the oppressed feel that they belong where, you know, on, on that naughty corner. Now, my question is, what, what do we do, you know, because I feel like we, we're not putting as much effort like for instance in the things like education dismantling the that whole thinking because right now i mean this, uh, typical examples is our minds are still pretty much oppressed in 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 a way that when you treat a fellow black there's that element of you know undermining them because that's how you have been conditioned when you see a white person there's a certain element of respect uh, given to that person, what is it that we need to be doing actually uh, to to deal with that? You know, deal with the mind sphere, making sure that the next generation have got a clear understanding that you know there's no better, there's no worse, there's no uh, superior or inferior. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Makola. Any other question, comments before we bring back uh, Mr. Komani to respond? Okay, Mr. Komani, you can respond. Thanks, uh, Mr. Magola. There is a saying which goes, if you name the devil, it requires. I, I suppose we should start uh, naming the devil. We should start naming all these incidences and conditions of oppression. We should, become, we should be louder than ever before to indicate that apartheid present is still present. And then we, in terms of intervention, it is very much important. This forms part of the pu public education. That is the civic responsibility that uh, we, we, are, we are executing. This is very much important, but let us formalize it. I, I wish to influence the situation whereby it becomes curriculum across the schooling system, even at the university level. Because you will see that universities are very good in producing good engineers, white engineers, in terms of the technical know-how, in terms of how they do the job. But you'll find that those particular people are still racist and those particular people end up moving into position of power very quickly because of the wild cards that I spoke about. So there must be interventions at the programmatic levels, at the level of public education, but also it has to be integrated in the curriculum across the, the schooling. 
including the 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 the, the post uh, uh, school uh, education and training sector. So that that should be uh, our starting point because we need to start somewhere. If you look at the history of apartheid, how it was conceived and implemented, it was uh, uh, conceived by one Ferhut, who was a psychologist, and then also uh, C. W. M. A. S. L. N. I think they were both psychologists as well, so they understood the, the, the power of the mind. That is why they came up with this. That is why uh, they came up with apartheid and they said it is going to be narrativized through various spaces of the society, including education. Education was the most important one, but also the public facilities. We know very well that the public facilities were demarcated according to race to highlight the issue of, of, of white superiority and black inferiority. Public facilities that were meant for black people, for example, they were not that much resourced. And so are the schools as well. And delicacy is still here for everyone to witness. And then if you look at, if you go into the spatial planning of townships and residences where white people stay, if Mr. Magula is familiar with Khuteng, if you go to Pretoria, for example, there is Atrejville, there is Lenasia for Indians. There is Esteras for Colors. And there are others who is Lane for white people historically. And if you look at the infrastructure there, the services, the resources, facilities there, you could see that black people were regarded as, as the fourth class citizens. And then you can go to Johannesburg as well. You see El Tarodo Park, uh, Lens, and Soweto, and so on and so forth. Those are the remnants of uh, spatial planning, which was engineered by the apartheid regime. So, uh, and I know that our government has done a lot in order to bridge that particular gap. But I think the most important one is the issue of internalized oppression. And we need to talk about oppression. We need to be free to talk about it. I don't know why people think that it is taboo to talk about it. And then if we don't talk about it, we don't name our pain and phrase frame our pain the way in which you want it. They are going to frame it for us. And the solutions that are, they are going to come up with and the options that are going to make up available to us are going to be limiting because it, is a, it, is, it will be to the extent that they want to maintain racial privilege. That is what will happen. So curriculum in all levels, public education, I should be compulsory. I, I don't understand why engineers at the university level it's supposed to be compulsory to do issues that have to do with racism. How toxic is racism? It's supposed to be across the board, every person, whether you, as long as you are a human being, because that is how it was done in the past, right? Why can't we do it as well? You don't have to be, we appreciate the fact that you, are, you have got the technical ability of doing your job. But what about a, a cultural competency of dealing with other people, regarding them as you are equals? And this is, problem is not going to go away on its own. It needs a deliberate effort to dismantle it, to expose it, to identify, dismantle and confront it. If you don't do that, we are not going anywhere. We are going to be talking about all these incidences of uh, uh, oppression, of racism that we have had in South Africa. They are not isolated incidences. They point to the existence of something that is perennial, something that is stubborn. That is the structure the white privilege, the structure, social structures that maintain white privilege. Thank you. I hope that I have answered the question. And th th there is another question. I've heard that the question says, uh, black, uh, white people, uh, black people, uh, white people, can, can white people also be victims of racism? And I, I say no. Why precisely? Because we need to be historical and contextual. We need to take into account the fact that racism in South Africa was specially designed to subjugate black people, not any other person. And there were laws, there were intervention programs across the board that were implemented in order to make sure that that is entrenched, that is engendered in the conditions of our lives or our beings. So there is a tendency of confusing people who have got racial prejudice. You know, when you have got racial prejudice against certain nation, like if you're a black person, then you talk ill about other people from the different groups. 
That is racial. Uh, 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 it may be regarded as racial uh, prejudice because it has to do with hatred. But there is no logical, there is no institutional logic that is supporting what we are doing. But when a white person says to you, you uh, refers to you with a K weight, he is reminding you of your pain. He is reminding you of the fact that you are exploited, you are marginalized, you are subordinated, you are inferior. And this is, and we need to contextualize it with history, the history of South Africa, the history of slavery, colonialism, and so forth. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Kumani. Any other comment, question? Chabulani, your hand is up, followed by Councillor Mavans. No, sure, sure, thanks. And, and, and we appreciate the, the presentation. Um, I just want uh, my leader to comment because he has given us some view in relation of the dimensions of, of, of oppression, particularly racial in particular. But also I would invite my leader to comment on the class context the oppression in class context, particularly when you look at the different levels of education, uh, private school versus the public schools. The education is different. Uh, uh, the understanding is different. If you look at, if you speak to a, a kid who's, enter, who's at a school in the township and speak to a kid who's at a private school, their understanding of the world around them is totally different. Is it a perpetual of a particular, a particular a, a perpetual and a creation of a particular class that would want to uh, oppress a particular class? Thanks very much. Yeah. yeah uh, let's, 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 uh, Mr. Koman, let's take Junior, mm. and then so that you can you can you can then respond uh, to both questions from Junior and uh, my Jabulani. Junior, thanks. Uh, and, and then then uh, sorry, Junior, before you start, we'll yes. also come uh, Councillor Mabaso. So you'll take three, then we'll, we'll, we'll you'll respond, Mr. Koman. Over to Junior. Yeah, thanks, uh, Comrade Sidik. And of course, an appreciation to the compile of a topic by soon to be doctor. I thought he was a doctor by now, I must confess. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised he's not a doctor yet. So I'm with you, Comrade Sidiko, on the notion that he should quickly accelerate that process. And I would share with you when we next time meet why I think it's necessary. <clears throat> but I want to maybe also invite Comrade Komane into, I'm interested on the first element of the entire topic where it speaks of power. <clears throat> and I'm trying to, in a sense, bring Comrade Komane into maybe assisting us in unpacking these relations that I think if we are to deal with it as a society, as, as the working class, let me say so, as I was avoiding to use this word, if we are to deal with this aspect of power as the working class, perhaps in my view, I'm thinking we would be able to as and when we contextualize the role that is played by the ruling party in government is extended to the working class. <clears throat> and I'm saying this, Comrade Komane, so that in your response, perhaps you assist me in being able to unpack the relation between responsibility expected and the power assumed by a particular office in terms of our governance, because 
in my understanding right now is that the the most critical error we commit is to think that when I am assigned to occupy a particular office, I'm assuming responsibilities of power. And that comes with a little bit of what would be an element of oppression. And it will also be utilized as a key towards specific privileges that I, I, I'm thinking that, and this is where we are failing insofar as the ruling party is concerned. And that's my observation, of course, I'm saying. So I'm saying in your, in your input, maybe you would assist us in understanding how can we then separate the two as part of us trying to go to uh, the question by Comrade Sam as to what is to be done in order to deal with what we have observed as a historical challenge that is perpetually continuing to exist amongst ourselves. And of course, with this type of a political breakthrough that we have achieved in 1994, but still find ourselves at the receiving end of oppression, at the receiving end of limited privileges towards economic emancipation. So I, I'm saying that would be the first element that may assist us. And I must agree, Comrade Sidiko, that <clears throat> maybe this topic alone would require us to deal with it not more than once because the power, privilege, and oppressions, in as much as Comrade Koman has unpacked it, it goes beyond the level in which we might think of now. And today he has also made us to unlock other elements of this uh, power, privilege, and an oppression uh, characters. Now, if we are to conscientize, like you had said, the society in so far as how to deal with this we would require to deal with this topic maybe more than once or maybe a full month dealing with the same topic up until to a point where we arrive at a conclusion that says this is the final product that we can say if implemented properly it can be able to liberate us from that so i was raising this as a form not necessarily interrogating or questioning, but to say to Comrade Komani in his response when he come back, kindly expand us on the power relations between a power and responsibilities that are expected. I think I would pause there. Councillor uh, Mabaso. Yeah, thanks, uh, Comrade Sidiku, and greetings to all participants and at the command. Uh, uh, Dr. Koman spoke about uh, privilege and uh, Stigo because um, the apartheid system is what I've heard from the, the from Dr. Koman. Uh, I don't know his prof yet, over here, but I, I nearly said prof uh, Koman, but maybe it, it's coming because this privilege. Uh, that uh, they've been used laws to enforce this uh, racial segregation, the, like the apartheid laws. You pass laws, you land act, your group areas, what, what, best. Those were, uh, they were legislation designed to privilege white people from what I've learned to what Dr. Koman has, has been saying. But now, since 1994, uh, we, we have a, a political power, but we have uh, members of parliament who are lawmakers in parliament uh, since 1994. But I don't know, maybe uh, maybe uh, Mr. Goman will say, is it is it the failure of our, uh, is it the quality of leaders we, we, we have, or is, is it they don't understand what, uh, are we failing to implement this uh, democratic constitution, because from 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 the angle where I'm sitting at the moment, we are struggling, and we 
we are far from uh, achieving this uh, economical from from the angle that is uh, if now we say we are implementing that uh, we are taking the land from these white people and uh, comrades who owns this uh, the seed hub this plantation that the white people are owning in the country now uh, maybe in Tatokoman will come and maybe give me confidence that we uh, we have leaders that are understand what they are doing in parliament because we, we it can't be correct that since 1994 we've been sending people in parliament to make laws and we are still finding ourselves at the situation where we are now as a country so my, my I'm 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 concerned where I am sitting now because uh, this uh, economic oppression. How how are we going to to move forward? Or how are we going to win this uh, the battle of getting the economy back? I, I hope I'm clear, uh, Comrade Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Mabaso. Over to you. Uh... Thank you, Zviko. I think that the first Money. question, yeah, the first question is about that last context. How do we contextualize the current schooling system, uh, giving uh, using a Marxist tools of analysis? I think we need to appreciate the fact that, or to acknowledge the fact that South Africa is a liberal society, is a capitalist society, in which the society is stratified according to certain classes, the upper class, middle class, lower class. Unfortunately, the lower class, the occupants, uh, lower status persons in this particular case are, are black people. And that manifests itself even in the schooling system. If you see the former Model C schools, they are well-resourced. They've got infrastructure because more money was invested in them. There were few of them, of course, in them. There were more money was invested in them in order to ensure that uh, uh, education, teaching and learning happens effectively in there. But the very same situation cannot be said about our township schools as well as our rural schools, precisely because that is where black people were predominant. Hence, we have the government which is trying to address the, the, those apartheid maladies. But the class inequalities are a hallmark of a capitalist society. The, there is no way in which we are going to level all the playing fields if we are still engaging the system within its own logic. Capitalism is about exploitation. Capitalism is about inequality. Capitalism is about subordination of one group by the other. That is how it is. So leadership needs to be aware of that. Even if they are not dismantling capitalism itself, but they need to know that is where the crux of the problem is. Capitalism, racism, patriarchy are linked to each other. At the end of the day, the section of the group that bears the brand of those particular systems in terms of getting negatively affected are the black people. I hope that I have answered that. And then in terms of economic power, uh, power and responsibility, 1994, was the end of apartheid, the beginning of the new democratic dispensation. I won't say it's a democratic order, I say it's a dispensation. And I'm saying it deliberately because democratization is an ongoing process. You never reach the destination and say, I have arrived. So what happens is that we had political power in the sense that it was our government who took over. That means they were in charge of coming up with policies to transform the society to bring black people into the mainstream economy. They talk about inclusive growth path. That's what they always talk about that. But unfortunately, if you look at the economic power, it rests elsewhere because that is where it matters. Marx will tell you that economy matters. Money talks. It is the money that buys the, the whisk, nothing else. And they, they always say that he who pays the piper pulls the strings. So they're talking about money. Money is the main currency in here. So economic power, unfortunately, is not resting within our interest, within our hands, although we control political power. 
But what we need to do, we need to be very strategic because those who are having economic power, they are not going to uh, 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 divest their interests. They are not going to, to, to forsake their economic power into us. So we need to be very strategic in terms of coming up with different mechanisms of ensuring that we are able to take from them. But this is a very big challenge. It's a gargantuan challenge precisely because if you look at the world, there is this thing called globalization in such, such that the world is intrinsically small, they are connected. What happens in USA affects what happens in South Africa and so is what's happening in Eastern Europe that is affecting us. The, 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 the conflict in Europe, is in Ukraine in particular, you can see that these things are connected to each other. We go to the Britain Hood institutions, that is your IMF and World Bank to borrow money. And then in what is called structural adjustment programs, they send, they, they send conditionalities to say, if you are going to borrow money from us, the microeconomic framework that you are going to adopt has to be neoliberal. We don't want the bloated public work system. We don't want strikes and so on and so forth. And so are the people who want to invest. We're always looking for people to invest in us. We have got mines, natural resources. Uh, 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 Sirigo will tell you about mine, investing in mines. It is a normal task. So the challenges are not that much simple, but we are not going to rest on our rails and say, in despair, we are not going to do this. We are, going to, we are not going to be in resignation. Those who in power should start by thinking about creative ways of making sure that they are able to take something from the group that is marginalized, that, 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 is, that, that, that is dominant, that is those who are the, the white monopoly capital, so to speak, if I may put it in that way. I think that is the relevant one. Those are the people who are controlling the economy. But we control the policy. We actually, we are not controlling the policy because the policy should always take into account their needs and interests, both strategic and practical. And then on the issue, what happened? What is the problem? Ever since we took power, we are still talking about the same problems. I think one of the problems, which I think is overarching, is the issue of diagnosis. The doctors, from a, a medical point of view, doctors will tell you that if a patient goes to the doctor and then you treat the symptoms, you have missed the point because you are not looking at deep-rooted cause of the problem. So we have not diagnosed what, as to what is the main problem. I've also spoken about the fact that we think that putting more women in, in parliament, putting more black people in corporate uh, uh, sector, we are transforming. We are not transforming. That is necessary but insufficient because if we look at the structure of power that is endemic, endogenous to that particular context, is the one that promotes white privilege. So whites will always have the word cut in those particular situations. The only time when we will feel at home is when we are in government, precisely because we have got political power. But we need to come up with interventions that are intended to make sure that we are able to develop ourselves. And, and, and there are so many, and then we can benchmark with other countries that have are developed as to how did they go about it. And I know there are a few countries in Africa that could cite an example that here is the liberation movement that fought for the liberation of black people and came into power and came up with a very good strategy of ensuring that black people are able to be in the mainstream economy of the country. I think that that is my, 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 my my, my, my contribution, uh, Mr. Ragulote. Thank you so much. Can you can you stop sharing so that I can I can share something and be able to see the participant? Please just uh, stop yes. sharing. Yeah, colleagues. Um, any other comments, questions? Before I I okay. There there is there is a. A question that came around class and also around why are we not moving an inch since 1994? And also 
and uh, Dr. Edi said we should we should continuously engage on this topic. Yes, this topic you cannot address it in one day. But we thought the best thing to do is to, to lay the foundation today. Let's lay this foundation. Because the reality is, and Mr. Goman will, 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 will add here, you can be in a position of authority but not be an authority. And, and we, we talk about this a lot uh, uh, with Mr. Coman. You can be in a position of authority, but not be an authority. So in simple terms, you can occupy an office of power, but not have power. You're just in that office, but you don't have the power. So when we, when we provide an analysis, it might happen that from 1994 to today, people are in position of authority, but they don't have authority. Or people are in the... Uh, uh, position of power, but they don't have power because the two are different. So that's why it's important for us to lay a foundation and define what is power, what is a privilege, and what is what is oppression. And maybe one day we'll realize that uh, there, there are people who are really in, 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 in office of authority, but they don't have authority. Or they are within uh, the office of power, but they don't have power. Any other comments, questions, while I'm trying to share something? Any other question while I'm trying to share something? Comments? I'm just struggling to, to, to share here. There, there are no comments. I'm struggling to share something here. And I, I thought you will, you will start uh, uh, making some comments while I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with technology. So if there are no, no comments from colleagues, uh, we, we want to announce that we will continue having these sessions um, on Friday we'll be talking about the research methodology. The reason we are doing that is to assist the postgraduate students who are on, on masters and, and, and uh, PhD on how to structure their research proposal. It will be delivered by, by uh, Dr. Philip Adu, who is a research uh, method specialist. And then on Sunday, we will talk about the link between the, the, the politics, the state and the government and giving it a SA perspective. We'll talk about the link between the politics, the state, and the government, giving it an SA perspective. Yeah, back to the question that was asked about why are we struggling? I don't know if you can all see my slide. Can you see it from your side, uh, Mr. Goman? Uh, we can see it. Yeah, well, yeah, like, it yes, it's, 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 we can see it. Yeah. If, if, if you want to understand the distribution of power, privilege, and oppression, you first have to understand 
the dialectical relationship between the base and the superstructure. And those who are from the left aisle of the politics, they'll tell you that the base influences everything that happens at the superstructure. So those who have got economic power, they are likely to influence an education system that we're having in a country, the legal systems, the media and the culture, and how we even run our families. So as long as you don't address the issue of the base, you are likely not to ensure equal distribution of power and privilege in a society. I will add to that uh, from, from 1994 to, to date, we have not done much in dismantling the base. We just operated on top of the base that was created for a particular class race and race. And we just then inherited, even at the superstructure level, whatever the ba their base has been influencing. We did not tamper with the legal system. We did not tamper with the, the ownership management control of the media. The base has tampered with our culture pre-1994, but we did, we did little to ensure that we restore our culture. The base influenced our religion. We did little to ensure that we, we, we bring back the way we have been uh, conducting our religion. In fact, the base itself has corroded a good system that was created by Jesus Christ himself, the Christianity. If you look at the way the, the base has corrupted even religion, you'll see people being given dooms and snakes and what what and what what and what what and the other one gaining more money by just giving those things. So that's how the economy, I mean, the base influences the superstructure. But today we did not want to go deeper into this one. We wanted to lay a foundation of talking about the power, privilege and oppression. But when you go on in other sessions, we'll bring in all these dialectical relationships between the base and the superstructure. The superstructure is there to maintain the base, but the base influences the superstructure. The base has ensured that they've put in systems, the legal systems, the education, and all these things to ensure that it maintains itself. So there is that dialectical relationship between the base and the superstructure. And where are we? post-1994. We are just in the middle somewhere operating on the base and the st structures that were not created in us. I mean, for us. When they created those structures and the bases, we were supposed to be just those who are supplying their labor and not benefiting from the fruits of the base. I wanted to say that any Inputs before I close. Just, just maybe to to add. Don't we think that? I mean, I know we're focusing on the South African context, right? But uh, uh, that the, the doctor mentioned the outside influence. I mean, if we look at a, at our country at the moment, you look at structures or institutions like IMF your World Bank, where we get most of our loans. Those guys, they always influence your legislative framework. If you are going to get anything from them, they want you to do things a certain way. Now, in South Africa, our base, as you indicated there in your, in your uh, uh, picture there, that space is occupied by the white South Africans, right? they are holding that economy and they are more aligned to the West, right? And we go to the West to, to ask for 
monetary help and we going to find ourselves trapped and now that transformation becomes even more difficult going forward if we find ourselves in these huge bills our government is now indebted to the west who di dictates how this whole thing has to work so that that work now becomes extremely difficult to do because it's no longer now just an issue of dealing with it locally now we've got we we are indebted to these other institutions that we cannot you know divorce ourselves from that's just you know the other thing that i'm seeing in in the whole thing you you, you are correct mr Mabul. and that's why we need to continuously raise consciousness of of members of society with the hope that the generation that's coming after us will take on the fight but the reality is that yes in most cases and even in south africa the base is influenced by even international forces and then they end up determining your legal systems your political your politics I, I vividly remember around 2017, whereby uh, these agencies that they are, the rating agencies, whereby a comment was made by a particular rating agency on their wish for the outcome of a conference of a governing party. I will take the rating agency as players on the base who influence our economy, but they were commenting on the issues of politics on top there. Because they want to influence the superstructure. And if those who are controlling the base, they are not happy with you. We had it many times. It can even affect your currency. They will determine the social order in your own country. In some parts of Africa, we have had allegations that those who are controlling the base from other continents, they will even influence or finance coup in other countries for them to ensure that they have a superstructure that will maintain the base. They will make sure that they control what you see on TV and read on newspapers and hear on radios. So that you can behave and act in the way that they want you to act. So let's continuously engage. Our trust, the Progressive Social Economic Investment Institute, it was established purely to do public benefit activities, which includes raising consciousness of people. And we're doing that by just hosting this part type of seminars and choosing various topics. Colleagues, if there's no any other addition from colleagues, I will uh, stop right here and bring in the document for his closing remarks before we officially close. Dr. Koman. Uh, I think the matter has been exhausted. Uh, and so everything is about power, privilege, and oppression. Even in the liberal society like South Africa, where we think that we, have, uh, we, we are in a post-struggle uh, 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 era. So, Basically, that is what I want to say. And I want to say that perhaps, because this was very broad, what we need to do, anybody who's interested can set his, his or her topic to you so that we can delve deeper into these particular issues as well. So any topic which is relevant, which is trendy is fine. So I think I've spoken, Mr. Rakul. Thank you so much, colleagues. We appreciate your participation. On Friday, around six o'clock, we'll be talking about how to structure your research proposal. And on Sunday, we'll be talking about the link between the politics 
the state and the government as a perspective. And once more again, thank you, Mr. Komani, for preparing and presenting on this topic. We really appreciate your input. And all participants, thank you so much and have a lovely evening. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Bye.